All right, we'll take it away. So, hey, everyone, I'm Sam Alkane. Welcome to our COVID-19 office hours for the food industry, the May edition. Looking back at last May, right, we had a seven-day average of around 22,000 cases a day at this point. And we're nearly back down to that with an average of around 24,000. And it looks like, at least on the slope right now, that we're still on the downward trend. So let's cross our fingers. And when we look at deaths, last May 25th, our average was 1,100 deaths a day over a seven-day average. Uh, and today, uh, it's only 543. So it feels like we have COVID-19 on the run. And looking at the vaccination numbers, we're around 62% of uh, people who are 18 or older in the U.S. with about one dose. And really about every other person in the U.S. who is over 18 is fully vaccinated. Now, those national averages hide some pretty big regional swings. I was looking, there are some counties that only have 17% of the 18 and older population vaccinated, and others have over 78%. So um, there's a lot of variation. you got to think about where you are. It doesn't include children. We're still working on those vaccine rollouts and approvals. So SARS-CoV-2 is still out there and circulating, and it's still a concern that we need to be paying attention to. We are seeing some big changes in public health guidance in response to the decline, right? The new CDC guidance is now that vaccinated individuals do not need to wear masks or socially distance, but you got to remember, if you're unvaccinated, you must still be wearing those masks and socially distancing. And it's interesting to see how communities are beginning to respond to this. Here locally at my grocery store, when I've been in there, I still see everybody wearing masks. Whereas I was in Florida a little week and a half ago, and it seems like no one there is. So people are, are responding to this guidance a little bit differently. And for your food businesses, the challenge is, what are you gonna do? You need to ask yourself, how are you gonna ascertain the vaccination status of your employees, your visitors and your customers? Are you gonna require reporting? Is it gonna be voluntary? Is there gonna be an honor system? And how are you going to handle these mixed populations to make sure that everyone is staying safe? And remembering that if you don't know someone's vaccination status or they are unvaccinated, they need to be wearing masks and socially distancing. And need I say, don't forget to consult with your lawyers as you're trying to figure out how you manage these changes. Um, now, as we're talking about changes to our COVID-19 practices, it's also a good time to kind of review how and where COVID-19 has challenged the food industry and we're going to start off the session today discussing a study of what those industry needs were, what those challenges were, and then we'll open up the, the floor to questions. So we've got a great panel with us today. Let me introduce the group. We've got Dr. Elizabeth Bin, who is the director of the Produce Safety Alliance and the executive director of the Institute for Food Safety at Cornell. We've got Dr. Martin Weedman, the Gellert Family Professor in Food Safety. He's the co-director of the New York State Integrated Food Safety Center of Excellence. Uh, we've got Dr. Aliosa Trimic, who's an extension associate in our dairy extension program and our COVID-19 resources guru. We've got Dr. Kelly Neal, a professor of microbial food safety in the Department of Animal and Food Sciences at the University of Delaware, where she explores the transmission of public health and food safety relevant viruses and pathogenic bacteria. We've got Dr. Ruth Petrin, who is the president-elect for the International Association of Food Protection and the founder of Ruth Petrin Consulting, with years of experience in identifying and tracking emerging food safety trends and new control strategies. Today, we've got our special guest, Dr. Renata Ivanek, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Population Medicine and Diagnostic Sciences here at Cornell. Her research involves a variety of epidemiological approaches, including mathematical modeling of infectious disease, spatial analysis of landscapes and weather data, statistical modeling and risk assessments. She's been leading a USDA funded grant to model COVID-19 transmission in food facilities and their impact on labor. And she's gonna be talking a bit about the industry needs assessment that came out of that project in just a little bit. Again, I'm Dr. Sam Alkin, assistant professor here in the Department of Food Science with a focus on dairy food safety and outreach. We've got representatives from New York State Ag and Markets, both the food safety and dairy divisions on the line, if there are any regulatory questions involving New York. And if you wanna ask a question, don't forget, uh, all you have to do if you've logged in on your computer is to click that little chat box at the bottom and you could type in your question. You can send it out to everyone or just individually to me and I'll read it out to the group. If you're on the phone, all you need to do is press star nine to raise your hand and then star six to unmute yourself. So start off with, I'll just have Al give us a quick update on what's going on on the website and then I'll pass it over to Renana. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, so obviously the... Uh... The big news this week is the updated CDC 
uh, guidelines on what vaccinated people can do. Um, and that's actually the topic of our uh, coronavirus booster uh, this week where, where uh, Elizabeth Demings and, and Karen Ospina talk about how is this relevant to the food industry. And they also cover the latest uh, COVID-19 numbers in US and, and globally. Um, we, update, we updated a couple of uh, FAQs and also added one uh, new FAQ uh, from uh, Cornell's Pesticide Management Education Program that talks about how EPA list N of disinfectants active against SARS-CoV-2 is still relevant, even though the, the general opinion is that uh, contaminated surfaces are not a, a risk, a major risk. Um, under templates and, and trainings, we updated our, our um, decision trees to include uh, the employees that are vaccinated, so actions and decisions when employee is vaccinated. Um, under management and training, we are, we are really making a good progress on, we already posted uh, seven modules um, of 11. Uh, the next one will be uh, a really important one, verification and validation um, of your mitigation strategies. Um, next one, we, of course, on the uh, vaccination information, you can find the updated CDC guidelines. And under New York state laws and regulations, there's also a document that uh, talks about how these guidelines can be implemented in, in different situations in New York state. Um, under Infographics, we also added a, an infographic from, from CDC that uh, shows nicely how to choose safe activities if you're vaccinated versus not vaccinated. Um, on our podcasts and webinars, uh, if you are from New York State, uh, tomorrow the New York State Department of Health will have a, a session where they update on um, uh, what are the new um, protocols for healthcare providers in New York State. Uh, and another one to emphasize, if you look uh, missed the last session uh, we did our office hours on April 27th. There's a recording where uh, Dr. Neil New Lewis uh, talks about how to increase COVID-19 vaccine acceptance. Um, visit our uh, virtual office hours tab to, to, to find out uh, information about our next office hours. And as always, if there's any comments or questions that you have, uh, use our link with, uh, with all the experts. We have experts from all fields, including Karen Ospina, that can help you out in Spanish if uh, Spanish is your preferred language. And with this, I think I can finish this uh, web page update uh, and give it back to you, Sam. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Al. Yeah, that, that talk last time with uh, Dr. Lewis was great. And I think it's still vaccine communication is, a, is still an ongoing issue. And so if you have time, it, it's good to review and catch up on that. But with that, I'll pass it over to our new special guest, Renata, uh, to talk a little bit about this uh, needs assessment and, and the work that's been going on. So take it away. Thanks, Sam. Let me share slides. All right, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, opportunity to share what we have done. As Sam said, uh, this is part of a larger uh, project the USDA funded um, about uh, COVID-19 specifically in the food industry and more specifically even in produce uh, processing operations, dairy, poultry uh, and beef. Uh, with pork operations and also on produce farms. So as part of that project, we did an, a needs assessment and I'm going to just, just give you some highlights from that project, uh, the preliminary findings really. So the goal of the needs assessment was to determine perceptions and needs of the food industry with respect to COVID-19. Uh, we used a survey instrument, um, electronic survey with 43 questions, quite lengthy. Uh, two questions in two parts uh, about participants overall food industry sector and then for a specific for a facility operation or operation of participants choice we ask for a few more informations um, all responses were collected in anonymous and confidential fashion uh, through Qualtrics um, eligible will everybody uh, eligibility was uh, 80 um, individuals 18 and older affiliated with a fresh produce operation 
or with produce, dairy, beef, pork, poultry, or other processing, food processing facility. And in terms of recruitment, we successfully administered the survey via social media uh, and also via 13 professional in trade uh, food industry organizations. And we specifically targeted management and those companies in the US. The survey was open from mid-January to early April. And uh, what I'm going to show you are results, again, pre preliminary results. Um, if I don't know what is the practice, if there are questions as I'm speaking, please share in chat or uh, speak up. I will try to monitor chat, but if I'm missing uh, some important question along the way, Sam, please let me know. I will chime in, yes. All right. So here we go. So uh, as I said, we, we were successful in administering the survey. Uh, here is a list of all uh, recruitment avenues that we considered. Uh, from pro fresh produce, dairy, beef, pork, poultry, general processing, and also so social media. Those involved were yielded success, different numbers of responses, re all responses received and those that were useful. Altogether, we had 145 responses, 79 useful for analysis. And in terms of uh, industry sectors represented, we were very uh, successful recruiting dairy processors with almost 50% coming from the dairy sector, 22% uh, one fifth from fresh produce sector, and then 30% were other. Other included a variety of uh, companies from chocolate to fresh, uh, sorry, to um, frozen produce to a beverage. So it was quite a bit uh, of diversity. As you can also see, we were not successful in recruiting anybody from the uh, uh, poultry sector or beef and pork. So that is a, already at the start acknowledged weakness. In terms of facility sizes, most of our participants were coming from medium sized facilities classified as 50 to 150 employees. Uh, one third were from large facilities and fewer about one fifth from small facilities. So for the next several slides, I'm going to show uh, you uh, graphs that look like this. These are heat maps. So and th at the top is the question exactly how we asked it. And then sub questions on the left. Uh, different squares have numbers in them, which indicate number of responses received for that particular level of concern, for example, here. Uh, we color, the darker the color, the more responses. So for example, this question asked, regarding control of COVID-19 in your industry sector, how concerning are the items below? And then we ask a number of items. Uh, on the far right side, I'm showing median score for uh, this, uh, uh, in terms of the level of concern for specific uh, item. So for example, if median score is four, it means that uh, when we ordered all participants uh, in, by the uh, height of, by the level of their score, four, 50 percent of them were at four or above. And so the larger the median score, the more concern. So here we go. Regarding this question, uh, regarding control of COVID-19 in your industry sector, uh, how concerning are the items below? More con most concerning, according to participants, were the complex and ever-changing government regulations about COVID-19 and the other one, labor availability, which was interesting and also perhaps confirming the, 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 the main reason why we were, I suppose, funded to this, do this research because we our, our, our primary objective was to address the issue of labor, labor availability in, in the food industry. Um, and so as a follow-up to each of the questions, we asked, is there something we didn't ask? Uh, what other concerns we should be worried about or we should consider? And so in those three responses, participants said things like uh, that, they that we should also, or that they are concerned about employee factors, including employee fatigue, vaccine hesitancy, health and healthcare access. Uh, other people said access to COVID-19 preventative measures, guidance and information documents, 
and also uh, some uh, uh, difficulties in implementation of mitigation strategies. And then some also in, uh, mentioned supply chain disruptions and management of contractor expectations. So these are free answers. That, so maybe there is one person who said uh, some of those aspects. So they should not be interpreted as uh, in a quantitative way as the other responses. We also ask regarding needs to successfully mitigate COVID-19 in your industry sector, how important are the items below? So, so uh, most, most uh, participants uh, consider easier way to understand regulation as, the, uh, as, as, the, as an important need. Um, other important needs were better information on cost effectiveness for certain mitigation strategies, uh, better, better and cheaper testing technologies, a better social distancing technologies, and also better training. And then in their free responses, they also offered different, uh, the need for technologies, for information about cost effectiveness and even harmonized guidance and priorities. We had one participant who, who was very um, upset by the fact that uh, different types of recommendations, and different content of recommendations were coming from different sources, including governmental sources. And also some pointed to the needs of consumer education, especially with respect to whether food is a source of COVID-19 infection. We also ask if computational modeling tools were available to predict COVID-19 mitigation strategies would most likely be successful in a given facility operation at a given time, how important would the model features below be to your industry sector? And this was important to us because we are developing as a different, as a, another part of this project, a mathematical model that I'll just feature at the very end to give you a glimpse of what it is all about. And so for all uh, features that we suggested as potentially important uh, to the food industry, all of them were considered as at least very, very important. So what is important to the industry if such a tool is available? They want the tool to be customized, that it's able to provide uh, decision-making support confidentially, that's easy to use, that can predict infection risk reduction, uh, that can uh, predict even cost, initial and uh, cost of implementation, initial cost and cost of implementation, and also that can predict uh, a production capacity, impact of production capacity. We also ask uh, regarding indicators of successful response to COVID-19 in your industry sector, how important are the items below? And so here we wanted to know how would the industry know that they have been successful in everything they have been doing, in all the effort. What is the, how do we know that we have done enough? And so interestingly, uh, participants consider as very important, at least very important, workforce-related contingency plans that minimize COVID-19 business interruptions, also investment into technologies that would reduce vulnerability to future pandemics or, or, or system-wide disruptions of, of this magnitude, um, establish risk communication plans, standard operating procedures developed, uh, and uh, also workers trained. And also considered moderately important were digital technologies uh, in, that could be used in planning or facility specific mitigation. We also ask regarding potential sources of COVID-19 infection in this facility or operation, how concerning are the items below? And so perhaps as expected, most participants considered activities in the local community as the most important source of infection for workers in their facility. Um, other areas uh, that were not considered important, for example, outdoor common areas, transportation conditions, or, or employee housing. At least they were not important. Perhaps they are important to certain subsets of the industry, but, but, but um, like as you can see here, they are very concerning to us to a relatively small number of participants or their facilities. And then we ask a series of questions about specific mitigation strategies that they have implemented in this facility. So we ask, have any of these social distancing strategies been applied in this facility or operation at any point uh, since the start of the pandemic? And 
uh, options to answer were no, not implemented at all, yes, but only partially or temporarily, or yes, implemented. And so we ask about a number of social distancing strategies. Those that have been implemented the most are uh, spacing of workers, adjusted sick day policies, staggered break times, and installed uh, physical barriers. Uh, less were implemented the staggered arrival times and the departure times, and much fewer uh, participants said that they are doing courting or downsizing operation, which makes sense because they would, especially downsizing operation would obviously have impact on the production capacity. And then we ask about uh, reasons for not, for lack of implementation. Uh, interestingly, we had uh, participants from small facilities, some of them uh, cited lack of concern or need because in their specific facilities, they didn't perceive need for such facilities, for example, one person said it's only me, or it's only three of us, or it's a family and we are all vaccinated or things like that. And then others cited concerns about infrastructure, productivity, and even union imposed constraints. That was an interesting response. And then in terms of biosafety, so we asked, have any of these employee biosafety strategies been applied in this facility at any point? So most, most implemented, are PPEs, uh, hand rubs, and enhanced hand washing. A fewer facilities were able to implement air cleaning and filtering, and even fewer uh, ventilation, which again makes sense because they require, uh, they're more difficult to implement and also more costly. Uh, when we asked, and that was, uh, uh, so facilities that were uh, for example, medium-sized facilities were more likely to implement those more expensive uh, uh, strategies. And when we ask for reasons why not implementing these uh, strategies, again, there was a, a cited lack of need, often for small facilities, uh, lack of funds or supplies, especially for PPEs. There was at some point there were the, the concern uh, was that there was no enough uh, PPEs, and then also infrastructure cons infrastructure cons constraints for some of the operations. And similarly, we ask for surveillance strategies if they have been implemented. And so here, most facilities or most participants cited uh, implementation or return to work post recovery policy, contract tracing and quarantine, and temperature screening and quarantine, but fewer are able to uh, test for infection and isolation. Uh, actually, uh, uh, so there was again, so here there, we've seen some uh, differences both in terms of size of facility and also in terms of uh, uh, industry sectors. So for example, the industry, dairy sector was uh, more likely to implement contact tracing and quarantine. And then we asked for free responses, why not implementing some of those strategies? they cited, again, lack of concern or need, their, their self-recognized lack of concern or need. Uh, they were also concerned about consequential worker increases in worker absences for some of those strategies, specifically for strategies that identify potentially uh, sick individuals, but not necessarily confirmed, and send them home, and then also cost of implementation. So, uh, that, those, that, those are the results of the uh, needs assessment. Uh, more than happy to come back to any of those. Apologies if I was rushing through. Uh, as I mentioned, we also are doing a, another big part of the, the grant is mo mathematical modeling, and that will be ready for presentation in this forum in the near future. But for now, I just wanted to give you a um, uh, highlight as Sam put it, a trailer so that you know what's coming. So we are uh, developing a model that predicts employee illnesses and work absences due to COVID-19. And in this initial effort, we are specifically focusing on a produce farm operation. And so the model is developed in such a way that we can test relative effectiveness of different mitigation strategies. Um, and then so we can, we can kind of give advice to uh, the user of which strategy would be more effective in preventing our two major uh, 
uh, matrices. One is hospitalizations, preventing hospitalizations over 90 days, and the other one, average number of workers absent per day. And so uh, this is just hypothetical example. So do not, uh, please do not uh, overinterpret the numbers, but just to give you a, a, a hint how this might look like. So if you do no mitigation at all, this is what we would expect over 90 days in a facility of 100 employees um, in, a, in a, a produce grower facility on average. In some uh, iterations, because uh, the modeling type, the models that we are developing are stochastic, taking into account uncertainty and variability. So on average, one person would be hospitalized, sick enough to be hospitalized. But then we can test a, a number of interventions in, for example, temperature screening with different temperature threshold and how that affects uh, uh, hospitalized workers and also uh, different vaccination rates, different reduction in transmission potential, let's say uh, using social distancing, mask and so forth. And then in terms of average worker absent per day, as you can see some, again, do not overinterpret the numbers, but some uh, interventions result in uh, large number of absences on any given day, and then others have no effect at all. This is just a uh, trailer, <laughs> so more is to come uh, in uh, probably approximately a month. And so until then, uh, I want to use this opportunity to, take to, to thank uh, our founder, the USDA NIFA, and also uh, the needs assessment results have been prepared by my graduate student, Sebastian Lano Soto, who's also here. And if there are more detailed questions, I'm sure he will be able to answer. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to uh, close my uh, sharing. Great, Ron. Oh, that, that's a great overview. Are there any questions from the audience around the, the needs assessment? Um, I mean, I'm excited to see what the what the models tell. There was um, one pre-submitted question around. So I know you mentioned right that we didn't have uh, uh, really any responses from like the poultry industry and and things like that. Um, do you think though that from what we've seen in this needs assessment? Um, that it's applicable? Do you think we see those same stories, those same needs in other food industries that, that we didn't capture? Or do you think that there's a lot of differences that, that it's hard to, to reference one to the others? Yeah, that's a great question. So because we received the most responses from, uh, from uh, produce and dairy, we are able to do some comparison, uh, comparisons among them. And so there are some differences. Uh, so for example, um, the, the, that's not what you asked, but just to illustrate yeah. the point. Yeah. So for example, uh, uh, pro, uh, produce sector, for them, financial limitations seem more important. And also for them, it's the, a great concern. The difficulty they are facing is the uh, difficult to understand regulations. And maybe that's related to the workforce uh, that they have to communicate with. So, uh, so to go back to your question, I think there should be differences across sectors. Now, which differences would matter for specific sector? It's hard to know. Uh, maybe it will be up to the uh, meat, um, beef, pork, and poultry sectors to take these results and then they, for themselves, interpret what applies to them and what doesn't. It's really unfortunate. We did try. We tried hard. To get their responses, but um, it just didn't work out. Maybe, maybe there was a feeling that they have already addressed those issues, and that there is no need to to share. Or maybe if there were other reasons, uh, concerns, uh, liability. We did, we were very careful not to ask sensitive questions, but uh, yeah, some people are sometimes asking. it's difficult to predict what's a sensitive question. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, but I, I think that was incredibly useful. 